given the importance of understanding how dipole works, we're going to continue considering the electric field due to a dipole. Last time was a 1D case. Now we're going to move it into a 2D case so you can see how the unit vector and the displacement vector comes into play and how we deal with that in 2D. On top of that, this will be a good first look as to how we make use of unit vector to deal with cases where we don't know where the point is because they're asking us to show that at all points on the x-axis or at all points on the y-axis. This will hopefully let you see why we make use of the unit vector notation as much as we do. Again, this is an example of a dipole where you have two equal and opposite charges held at a fixed distance apart. Under normal senses, if they're not held there, opposite charges attract, they would come together and neutralize. But in these cases, they're somehow held with a certain distance apart somehow. And again, this will be important in considering how a neutral object when placed in close proximity to a charged object, you either get existing dipoles going in all random direction, they would align themselves because the negative wants to be closer to the positive charge outside. And so all the po negative is closer than the positive, so you get the attraction that you have. And how big that attraction is will strongly depend on what we're going to be calculating in a second. If there's no existing dipole, you could have a neutral molecule, but within that neutral molecule, the electron distribution can still slightly drift towards the positive charge, and so you'll still get that dipole forming. So once again, knowing how these dipoles function will be very critical in understanding how and by how much neutral objects are attracted to external charges. So that's why we're spending this much time dealing with it. This and all the while giving you a good exposure as to how to deal with electric field summing using unit vectors in 2D. To the question itself. Now, given two discrete charges, it's possible to work out the electric field at any given point in space, say this point. You can work out the total electric field by working out the contribution of each of the charges individually. And that's just two charges you have to add up. So the positive will point away from itself, and then the negative will be slightly smaller but point towards itself. You eventually get a sum that looks something like that. The overall distribution sort of end up looking like this. Out of the positive into the negative, something like that. And there's nothing stopping us from plotting every single point, working out the electric field at all those points based on two charges. Instead of doing it for any arbitrary point, many textbooks, including this one, likes to focus on two special cases. They're primarily chosen because of certain symmetry in the problem that makes the algebra looks a little nicer. And there's a certain elegance in seeing that. So let's look at part A. So part A, we're talking about every point on the x-axis. So let's pick an arbitrary point, P here. We're not necessarily going to care so much about the sign because the notation in this textbooks, without the vector sign on top, what they're saying is we're just caring about the magnitude. So the signs of it won't matter as much. Following the notation of x here, the assumption is that this point P is x away from the y-axis. So right away, we can already write that the positional vector of P is x in the i-hat direction. Here comes the symmetry part. From the positive, instead of putting plus and minus, let's go call this Q1, call that Q2. From charge 1, the positive charge, will have a electric field away from itself. That's 1P. And then this here, Q2, will have something that goes towards it, E2P. Now, because P is exactly the same distance from both of the charges being equal and opposite, the electric field must also have the same magnitude. And given the geometry, you can see how all the horizontal components cancel out each other, and so you end up with a field that should go straight downwards. And that's the symmetry we're talking about in this case. But let's just do the whole thing and we'll see how it all falls out. Again, the sum of the total electric field P has two contributions. In this case, we've got one plus two. So let's do them one at a time. KQ1 over the displacement factor from 1 to P, and then 
the unit vector of the same displacement vector. Final minus original, which is x in the i hat minus, in this case, a in the j hat, because the positive q1 is a and up on the y direction. Minusing a positive, just to keep it straight, so the overall vector looks like that. Then we need to find out the size, and the size, of course, is the square root of the x component plus the y component, so there's the x squared plus a squared term. So now that we have the magnitude of the displacement vector, we can get the unit vector simply by doing a division. So the unit vector r1p is r1p divided by the magnitude of the same vector. So you have xi minus aj all the way over that and that. And so you can rewrite this as square plus a square i hat plus negative a over square root of x square plus a square j hat. So that's the unit vector. Subbing all in, we'll get that this guy is equal to k positive q, big Q, over this thing, all squared, times the unit vector, which is somewhat lengthy. We can multiply it in, but we can do that later as well. Very similarly, if you follow through the same line of reasoning for e2p, we need to find out the displacement vector here. And in this case, we have rp minus r2. And r2 is negative aj. So when we subtract a negative, we end up with a positive, actually, which makes sense because to get to from point 2 to point p, we got to go up in the y and go to the right with the x. We do the same thing again, find the magnitude, which is square root of x squared plus a squared. And then the unit vector follows very similarly, and you get that. Solving the other rn, you get k negative q over all that stuff, and like that. Pointing out here, there's a negative sign there from the charge. So we put those both in, and then we can add the i and j components separately. I'm going to factor out the k and the q, as well as this part underneath. Anytime you have a square root and square, that's basically the absolute value. But since these are all square underneath anyways, it's going to be all positive. And so you have from the first one, and then the second one, plus. And remember, these have to be distributed into both of these. So you have negative x. And now you can see that these guys are positive and negative of each other, so they cancel each other out. These guys are both negative, so they add up to give you a more negative answer in the j direction. So both the horizontal direction cancel out as we expect. And that's, again, part of the elegance of using the unit vector notation to help us take care of all the directions, so we don't have to worry too much about that. And then what you're left with is negative 2a in the j hat direction. And so there we have it. We have the total electric field, which points downwards in the negative j hat direction as we expect from our sketch. Now, here's a key step. If we go back to the question for a minute, they specifically talk about for this condition. So there's an approximation that needs to get done here. And this we often do in this course to make the math look easier and more elegant, just to give us a better idea of how to interpret the math. The key condition is that x is much, much greater than a. So you look back at the result that we have. If the size of x is much, much greater than a, then we have an approximation. The approximation that we're going to make here is we're going to argue this looks very much like a Pythagoras kind of idea where you have x squared plus a squared it's equal to r squared, say. As x gets longer and longer and a stays the same size, so x is say this long, you can see that the r, which is the square root of a square plus x square becomes much, much more like x itself. The little bit of difference here is not going to be very significant in adding to it. Or you can argue that if you have a small number, you square it, becomes extra small number, so it contributes even less to the sum. So what we're trying to say is for this condition, we can say that x squared plus a squared, it's roughly equal to just x squared. 
applying that to our result, we will get kq, that doesn't change. The x squared plus a squared underneath just becomes a simple x squared minus 2a. So the a on top, we're not changing. We're not saying a is about 0. We're not saying that. What we're saying is when x is much more greater than a, this down here from x squared plus a squared just becomes a simple x squared. Everything else stays the same. So putting it all together, again, the square root square, it's the absolute value. So, in fact, doesn't matter if x is positive or negative, we'll get the electric field pointing straight down. Now to finish off the question, what we want is just the magnitude, so drop out the negative sign and the j hat, which defines our direction. And then one last step to make it look exactly like what they have is they have this funny epsilon thing. The Coulomb constant k, in fact, can be broken down into more fundamental constants, um, which involve this epsilon. We'll deal with that in a couple weeks, but as far as you are concerned right now, it's just another constant involving this 4 pi factor. So summing that in for k, and then crossing out the top, we'll get qa over 2 pi x cubed. And so you can see that the electric field is actually directly proportional to 1 over x cubed. Unlike the case where you have a single charge and things drop off it's an inverse square, if you have a dipole, to the side of the dipole anyways, call that x, the electric field actually drops off as 1 over x cubed. So it's not always 1 over x squared, as Coulomb's law implies. So depending on the distribution, things can work quite differently. So let's take a break here and we'll tackle part b, which is along the dipole axis in the next video.